In this podcast, Professor Richard Griffiths visits the recently excavated tomb of a Sogdian inhabitant of Chang, the ancient capital of China, who died almost 1300 years ago. The Sogdians were a peoples with their own language, music, and religion, who provided many of the traders along the trade routes of the Silk Road in this period, but which have subsequently disappeared, assimilated into mainstream Islamic or Chinese cultures. The tomb provides a fascinating insight into this unique culture. Hi there. My first acquaintance with the Sogdians came over a decade ago when I visited the Sanxi History Museum. While I was there, I saw a beautifully decorated funeral bed. But the museum was busy, I was too far away, so I moved on. I failed fully to appreciate its significance. I do now. But let's fill in a little background first. The Sogdian peoples were originally from present-day Iran. They appear in history about 2,500 years ago. They settled in an area congruous with present-day Uzbekistan and Tajikistan. Their main city was based near where Samarkand is today. The Sogdians reached the apogee of their wealth and prosperity between the 4th and 8th centuries of the Common Era. They shared a common language, they had a distinctive culture, but they had no central government. They were ruled by a series of small kingdoms. The area they inhabited was rich in agriculture, they were skilled metal workers and craftsmen, and they straddled the east-west trade routes known as the Silk Road. This central location along the trade routes, as well as the absence of any career alternatives that might have been offered by a large central government apparatus, may explain why they became known as the merchants of the Silk Road. The Sogdian homeland was eventually consumed by the Muslim armies in the 7th and 8th centuries, and the populations converted to Islam. But while they flourished, communities of Sogdian merchants could be found all along the trade routes and the oasis towns that punctuated them. Which is why Anjian, in 579 CE, was buried on the outskirts of Xi'an, over 4,000 kilometers from the town where his ancestors had originated. Anjia's tomb was discovered in 1999 and excavated the following year. At first, it looked like a typical Chinese tomb of the period, a narrow stone passage leading to an underground chamber. There was really no reason to expect otherwise. But traditionally, Sogdians weren't buried. They were either cremated or their bodies were laying exposed to be consumed by animals. So this particular Zobian had chosen to be buried in the same way as a high-ranking Chinese, but with a twist that we'll see at the end. At the entrance of the tomb, Anjia had placed a stone epitaph introducing himself to us. The epitaph is written in Chinese. He explained he'd been born in Wuhai, Gansau province, which was itself uh, 1,400 kilometers southeast of Xi'an, even further away from his ancestors. And at the time of his death, age 62, he was a Saboa, a community leader in Tongzhou, just north of Xi'an. He'd also been an area military commander in his time. Now, the epitaph doesn't mention his Sogdian heritage, although his Chinese name, An, marks his family as originating from Bukhara, the kingdom of the An. Now, this omission may have been because two years before his death, there was a revolt against the Tang emperor, led by a Sogdian Turkic general called An Lushan. The revolt did not exactly endear the Sogdians to the ruling classes, especially in the capital, which might explain why Anjia chose not to explicitly mention his origins in his epitaph. Incidentally, the rebellion lasted eight years, and its demise felt the beginning of the end of Sogdian influence in China. Now, the entrance of the tomb is flanked by two stone pillars surmounted by a stone relief lunette, depicting the judgment scene from Zoroastrian religion followed by the Sogdians. The religion was based on the teachings of Zoroaster, who lived in what was now Iran some 3,500 years ago. And he professed that there was only one God, that there was a struggle between good and evil, 
and that there was an afterlife. The lunette at the entrance shows the passage of Anjian to the afterlife. But, okay, it's a bit difficult to see, so let's have another look at it in outline form. Anjia sits at the bottom right of the lunette and his wife at the bottom left. The half rooster, half men on either side is a representation of the god Shrosh, who helps souls across the bridge to the next life. They're also the priests. They're wearing face masks to protect the purity of the fire from their breath. The rather fluid minstrels floating above them are Apsara, spirit creatures derived from Buddhism. The three camels in the centre carry a fire altar, and fire and water were two very important elements in Zoroastrian rituals. The shape of the lintel itself suggests the bridge over which Angia must travel to reach eternal life. The bridge gradually narrows until at the end it's almost impossible to cross, and only those who have lived the pure and truthful life will pass. Those that fail will fall and be consumed by demons. I don't know what from this display the archaeologists were expecting inside the tomb, but I doubt whether they expected to find a traditional Chinese funeral bed. But that's exactly what they did find. A stone bed made up of three carved and painted panels, one at the back and one on each side. Although the bed may have been typical of Chinese style of the period, the artwork was anything but. In total, there were a total of 12 painted panels, all but one showing two scenes. And I've included them all here so you can return and look at them at your leisure. But I want to take a little time to highlight one or two in particular. Now, many of the scenes show Anjia talking to small groups of presumably important people, but one seems to be particularly important to him since it occupies a single panel. It shows Anjia in conversation with a Turkish dignitary or merchant. They're seated in a pavilion, and in the foreground there's a bridge crossing a stream. Interestingly, painted a little smaller and to one side are two Chinese officials in typical Tang dress standing in attendance. Drawn smaller, perhaps, a small revenge for all the slights that he might have experienced in life. Two scenes depict hunting, but I doubt whether there would have been lions and tigers around for him to hunt. But hunting was a high status pastime, and the poses adopted in the two scenes are typical depictions that appear elsewhere in Sogdian paintings and metalware so he might just have been showing off. Now, there's one scene that gets very little provenance, but I like to think was special to him. It clearly depicts him and his wife riding on a cart pulled by two oxen. And it reminds me of a moment when I was driving along a country road in Thailand when we passed exactly the scene like that predicted. A couple were coming from their wedding. So perhaps this scene depicts his wedding day, which might explain why the most repetitious scene depicts three different moments from the same dance. Now the Sogdians were known for their frantic, swirling, twirling dances and for the drink accompanying them. The drunken Sogdian was a typical stereotype. But perhaps this was the joyous celebrations following the wedding. Well, Let's leave the dance for now and return for a moment to the tomb itself and the last twist that I promised you in the story. Here we have a Sogdian official working within the form of a Chinese tomb, but with the imagery derived from Sogdian culture. But his body never lay on his funeral bed as would that of a Chinese. No. His body had decomposed elsewhere and his bones were scattered over the floor of the tomb, 
just as they would have done if the corpse had been exposed to nature to consume. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed this broadcast. Music was composed by Janet Zaddo, director of the Florence Youth Orchestra, and the details of where to find us are on the following slide. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Goodbye.